Hey folks, welcome to Fig Tree Ministries. A couple of announcements today before we get to the lesson. If you'd like to join our Bible study, we are going to start a new session on September 21st. That's a Tuesday night. We're going to start at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, and 5 p.m. Pacific. And we're going to go through the Gospel of Matthew and then use that as a template to go through all of our biblical studies. And it's going to be on Zoom. If you go to figtreeteaching.com, our website, you can sign up for our newsletter. And God willing, within the next week, we'll have the link that you can sign up to the class. So be looking for that. The second thing is our normal Bible study this past week had to be canceled due to Hurricane Ida and some power outages. So I decided to put up a class this week that was recorded back in June of 2019. So this is a class we did that began a, a little series on the triumphal entry in Mark chapter 11. And we wanted to get a video out this week. So I decided to pull out this one because it's one of our favorites. So enjoy today's lesson on the triumphal entry and Jesus's action around something that's called Eruv. Enjoy today's lesson. Okay, we're getting close to the end of Mark and we're hitting this story where Jesus is now going to enter Jerusalem for that Passover celebration in which he becomes the Passover lamb or as we if we think about covenant he becomes that covenant ratification ceremony where it's his blood that ratifies the covenant on the cross. But before he does that, he's going to do a, he's going to make a splash, so to speak. He's going to gain everybody's attention as he's coming into Jerusalem. You can see I have week one. Now, I don't know how many weeks this is going to take because there's a number of different things that we have to look at. So this is just an artist rendering. Giotto di Bonadone, around 1300, he painted this. So let's go, we'll take a look at, Mark, you can turn to Mark 11. And we're actually going to read verses 1 through 11. And pick out some details that Mark is putting in the text that are going to help us understand what's going on in the story. Now, there's at least five things that I can think of that we have to talk about that are going on in, the, in Mark 11. So the first one we'll do today is there's two cities that are mentioned, Bethany and Bethphage. So we'll talk about those, and we'll see that as the week that Jesus goes into Jerusalem, the week before Passover, he's going back and forth between Bethany and Jerusalem. So what's going on in Bethany? Why does Bethphage matter? We'll talk about that today. So these two cities. We need to uh, tackle the idea of Zechariah 9.9. So Zechariah 9.9, you know, as your king comes to you humble and riding on a donkey. Clearly, we're going to see that Jesus is fulfilling this. Matthew tells us that Jesus fulfills this prophecy. But what's going on in Zechariah 9.9? Why a donkey? because there's all kinds of donkey symbolism. So we'll talk about that. Okay, the third one is there's a strange story about Jesus apparently doesn't like this fig tree. So we need to talk about the cursing of the fig tree. Why is it important that he curses a fig tree? And what does a fig tree represent in the, to a first century Judaism? Because it's a lot more symbolism than we expect which, of course, is a lot of the biblical world. They make the trees and plants and animals and everything that's concrete turns into a symbol for something. Number four, as Jesus enters the city, they suddenly start chanting Psalm 118. Why? There's something about Psalm 118. King David, that shows up. And then 
a very strange passage about palm branches, and we'll see that's in what we read today, because the Passover holiday doesn't have anything to do with palm branches. The holiday in the fall, called Tabernacles, that one has to do with palm branches. So why are there a group of people holding palm branches, chanting that they want Jesus to be the king? What are they asking for? We need to explore that a little bit. And then the last one is there's a suddenly this very strange discussion about Jesus, your faith, and moving mountains. So we need to look at where is he taught, where is he standing while he gives that little talk? And then what are some of the things in the area or from the text that would help us illuminate what he's talking about? So these are just, that's why I don't know how long it's going to take us to do this. I might be able to scrunch some of those into one lesson, but. Okay, now let's go, let's go read the text. So Mark 1, 1 through 11. Mark 11. 1 through 11. There's a lot of ones in that. According to your Bible writers, what are they titling this? Triumphal entry. This one says Jesus comes to Jerusalem as a king. So clearly our Bible translators see something in the story, and I think we will too, that says a king is arriving. Okay, so here we go. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to, and here's our two cities, Bethphage and Bethany. So we'll look at those. And it, those are uh, at the Mount of Olives. That's going to come into play. You have a map on the back of your sheet. I will get there eventually to help you. I know it looks like something from an eye chart at the doctor's office. Okay, so as they approached these two cities, Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead. He says to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt. Now that word colt, in the Hebrew Bible, the word is a donkey. It gets translated into the Greek in the Septuagint that where we get this word colt. So when you hear colt, do you think donkey or horse? Horse, usually we think small horse. But the Greek word is the translation for the, the Hebrew word for donkey. So we know that there's something with a donkey going on here, not a horse. Okay, so you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them the Lord needs it and will send it back shortly. Now, boy, I don't know if we'll get to exactly... There's lots of meaning built into that. I don't know that we'll have time to get there. Okay. Verse 4. So what do they do? They go into the village and they find the, the colt or the donkey. They find the, the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untie it, now the people, of course, are, hey, what are you doing with our donkey? They said, what are you doing? And they answered as Jesus told them to. And they let him go. So something's happening where the the people are recognizing there's something customary that they're not upset that you just took a donkey. Okay, verse 7. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road. And then those, here's the last verse about the, the, the branches. While others spread branches, they had cut in the fields. And so that throws scholars for a loop. Why did they cut branches and are they carrying them into a Passover celebration? Now, watch the crowd reaction. This is, we're going now to verse 9. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hoshana, save us. So that's a chant to be saved or save us now. Hoshana. Where does that word come from? Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Come and rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. Hoshana. So they're shouting for Jesus to save them. What kind of king are they looking for? Yeah, they want a king, and they want a king to go, this is Passover, right? 
what did God do to Pharaoh on Passover? He overthrew the, the most powerful person in the world. What do they want Jesus to do for the, to the Romans? Overthrow the most powerful people in the world. Come on, Jesus, you can do it. So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's Psalm 118. Blessed is the coming of our father David. So they're, they're clearly, they see whatever Jesus is doing as something to do with David and what they want David to do. So Hosanna in the highest. Okay, this is what's happening right now. So geographically, sorry for those who don't like geography. So here's the Mediterranean Sea to the west. You have the Dead Sea down here, 1,400 feet below sea level. Many of you have been there and floated in it. Here's Jerusalem to the south. So that's where Jesus is going. His ministry takes place up there at the Sea of Galilee. So he's going to travel from the Sea of Galilee south through that Rift Valley. So he goes south, and he, there's a story that takes place just before this in Jericho. We'll look at that when we talk about King David. But he hits Jericho, and at Jericho, you take a right, and you start heading uphill. And it's 3,500-foot climb. It's not exactly like you're just on a stroll. It's in the desert, and you're climbing uphill. He hits Jericho, and he heads in towards Jerusalem. So one of the crazy things that scholars notice here is how far did he just walk? Something like 80 miles. He walks 80 miles. He's only one kilometer from Jerusalem. He says, go get me a donkey. Like, at this point, you want a donkey? Why didn't you get a donkey back in Jerusalem? You could have saved yourself a lot of effort, right? Or, I'm sorry, back in Galilee. So he's, he's very intentionally arriving at a certain point and saying, get me a donkey, because I'm going to make a statement. So one uh, scholar, his name is David Flusser, he passed away a few years ago, Jewish scholar, says he wouldn't be surprised if Jesus got on the donkey, crossed over the, the city limits line into Jerusalem, got off and kept walking. All he wants to do is make his point. I'm coming into you, Jerusalem, on a donkey. Okay, let's go closer then. So here's a closer look. There's Jerusalem. Jericho is up here in the corner, so that's where Jesus is turning right. And he starts heading uphill towards the Mount of Olives. And then there's two cities. Now, this map has Bethphage a little bit different than the map on the back of of your sheet, but there's Bethany and Bethphage, and now we'll go to the map on the back of your handout. So here on the screen, the star, sorry, it's a little hard to see, that's where the temple is. Then Bethany is a little bit south and west, and I put a line underneath it just to help you visually see where Bethany is, or at least where these the person who drew this map is telling us. Yeah, a little bit different than the other map, right. Well, the hard part is Bethphage. They're, the hard part is the city Bethphage. Because it's so small, they can't archaeologically identify it. Okay, and then the Mount of Olives is right here. Many of you have been up there. It's not that far from Jerusalem, about a little over half a mile from, from the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so that's our geography. Now the question is, let's look at these two cities. So the first one is Bethany. What's the word bet in Hebrew? House. So you can see right there in the name, the name means the house of something. Bet-ani. Now what does ani mean? It means misery, or suffering. Hey, kids, guess where we're going to move to? Bethany. Oh, yay. Now, why? Why is... Is it because everybody who moves there suffers? Or, if you're suffering, where do you go for comfort? You go to the house of suffering. 
See, we could call all of our hospitals Bethany. It's a house of suffering. Where do you go when you're suffering? Uh, we had a, a Bible study years ago, and there was a, a girl who was staying at these people's house, and her name was Bethany. So one day I said, you realize your name means house of suffering. She's like, oh, great, thanks. That cheered me up. I said, no, 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 think about it. Where do suffering people need to go when they're hurting? They need to go to you because it's there that they find comfort. So you can embody the name House of Suffering by being a place to provide comfort for those who are hurting. Now, the question is, is this like a village that was established for those who are sick? And they call it then the House of Suffering. Okay, we'll look at once we'll look at something from the Dead Sea Scrolls in a second. Now the next city is called Bethphage. This translates into the house of unripe figs. Now, do you think it's coincidence that there's a city called the house of unripe figs, and Jesus is going to go look at a fig tree that doesn't have any ripe figs? And it's exactly in this area. So there's something happening there. I don't know that we'll quite figure out the coincidence, but let me just show you this real quick. This is one of the caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. This is actually Cave 4. There's 16 caves, I think, something like that. In Cave 11, they found something called the Temple Scroll. And it's giving you all kinds of regulations about the temple area. And I put the scholar's name up there, Yigael Yadin, very famous Israeli archaeologist. He wrote a book about the Temple Scroll, and what they noted in the Temple Scroll, in the, in the Temple Scroll, the Essenes set apart three cities just to the east of Jerusalem for those people who are in state of ritual impurity. So let's say you have an issue of bodily discharge, or you have a skin disease, like, say, leprosy. Are you allowed to go into the holy city and into the temple? temple area. No. So if they're that concerned about skin disorders, where do they send you? Out to the house of suffering. Okay, so I just wanted to point out, this is a resource if you want to read about the temple scroll, but that's, you're looking at a hundred years prior to Jesus. Are they making regulations about who can go into the holy city or not? And so if these two cities are just outside the boundary of Jerusalem, then it might make some sense that one of them is called the house of suffering. So the question, going back to our definition here, is, is Bethany a leper colony? Because you would think, well, Jerusalem's a large city, 60,000 people. If anyone gets leprosy, they're kicking them out of the city. So where do you go? So... When we get to Mark 14, at the Passover time, he goes to dinner at somebody's house in Bethany. Do you remember? Do you know who the name of the? Simon the leper. Now, why does Simon the leper live in Bethany? So now you think, okay, well, maybe that is a leper colony. Maybe it actually is living up to its name, the house of suffering. Yeah. So one, either they had some issues that kept them in a state, state of ritual impurity that they're there. Maybe they're serving. The other one that um, scholars note is that if this is an Essene city, most of Judaism wants you to get married and have kids. Except for one group, and that was the Essenes. And they held that you could be single, and dedicated towards God. So Jesus, if he's not married, which would seem strange, he would fit in with the Essene group. If this is an Essene city, and you have two sisters and a brother that don't seem to be married or have kids, then maybe they're part of the Essene group. Now that's just pure, you're just trying to figure out based on some of the historical things about that city. But yeah, it's a good question. Why are they in why are they there at Bethany? I'll tell you what, there's another one too. Within within Judaism, 
if you read, there's a book by, uh, what's his name? Raphael Patai is his name. Raphael Patai has a book called The Messiahs. It's all, it's all how Judaism and their tradition talks about the Messiah. And one of the things that they, it, within Judaism, very strong tradition, is that you'll know the Messiah is here because he's over with the lepers. And so people look at him as the leper Messiah. That's who he's coming to heal. Well, if that's in any way true, where's Jesus always hanging out with? The lepers, yes. So there's something about that tradition within Judaism that is fairly strong. Okay, so here's the question. Why Bethphage? Why mention this city? Why does Jesus stop there on his way to Jerusalem? Well, let's go take a look. So everyone say Eruv. Eruv. And Eruv, it means something like a mixture of sorts, but it's got a technical name to it, or it's got a technical meaning, meaning it means something that's not really what the definition of the word is. Eruv, yeah, so if Eruv means mixture, you go, well, how do they get this out of mixture, right? Well, it takes on a technical meaning. It's some kind of Sabbath boundary marker. How far you can travel on the Sabbath. Now, what's so cool, and I've been so excited to teach this lesson here, is because God willing, if I've done my job, the lights will start coming on in your mind. And that when we talk about this topic here versus community church or the church where I've taught this before, there's, it's very abstract just over in La Mesa, but it won't be abstract here. Okay? So an aruv is some kind of, you'll, you'll all see, an aruv is some kind of Sabbath day boundary marker. Why? Now don't turn there because we don't have time. But in the book of Exodus, God is giving them manna. Then he says, on the Sabbath day, or I'm sorry, the day before the Sabbath, I'm going to give you double. Because on the Sabbath day, you're not allowed to go out. Now, so the text says, bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. Now, in this particular case, they're talking about the camp. When they first come, come out of Egypt, they're in a camp. But if you're going to continue to follow this commandment, what the heck does that mean? Don't go out. Go out of where? What if you're in a sprawling city like Jerusalem? What, is, what do you mean, go out? How can I keep obeying that commandment? You have to give me a definition, a boundary. So it says, don't go out. Now, next one, again, don't turn there, shows up in Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah generally isn't very happy with how the people, the leaders of Jerusalem have been operating. And one of the things that he's really upset about is how you behave on the Sabbath day. And he says this. This is what the Lord says, be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. What the heck does that mean? And now notice how cool God is. God tells a, a community of people or something, don't carry a load. And what does he expect all of you to figure out? What does that mean? And get along while you're doing it. Figure out what it means, and oh, by the way, continue to love your neighbor as yourself while you're doing it. Don't fight with each other. So everybody comes up with their definition of what does it mean to carry a load into or out of something. Okay, so do not bring a load out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath holy. Verse 23, yet they did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and would not listen or respond to discipline. But if you are careful to obey me, declares the Lord, and bring no load through the gates of the city on the Sabbath, but keep it holy, 
And then it goes on to say, you know, of course, I'll bless you for that. So because of this and the idea of don't go out, we have to make a boundary around where we live that to helps us define how to keep these commandments. So what you get is this. You get an aruv. That's where you get the idea of creating a boundary marker. So here is, let's see if this is the right slide. This is a picture of an aruv. Now, it's really tough to see, but right here, see that string right there? It's a very thin wire. Up on a pole, it's a very thin wire. Now, this pole happens to be a radio antenna as well, but they don't all look like that. This is a little village just outside of Tel Gezer. Okay, see, the light bulbs are already going off in your mind. Okay, let me show you a different picture. So there's the, there's the pole, and you can see the wire right there. That's the aruv for this little village. Okay. One more. There's a little bit closer, and you can see it's just a very thin. This is how wherever you go in the world today where there's an Orthodox Jewish community, you'll find an aruv set up given as a boundary. Now, you see, the fact that all of you are nodding, now you know why I'm so happy to be teaching this year. Okay. Okay, this is great. This is exactly it. So you guys are sitting inside of an Aruv. So, okay, I'll show you the map. I'll show you the map in a minute. This is the website. It's a, it, it encompasses a large, I'll show you a map in a minute, but this is their website. Because you have Bet Jacob and you have Orthodox Jewish community, where are they allowed to move on a Sabbath day and still be able to carry a load? That's what you want to know. I've got, I've got to push my, uh, my stroller to the synagogue on Saturday. Am I allowed to carry a load? The answer is, as long as you stay inside of this, you haven't left the boundaries. The Aruv is the boundary marker that says, so if you're in Jerusalem and it's a Sabbath day, you can move around inside the Aruv all you want can't go outside of it and you can't carry a load back into it it's helping them to obey these commandments of god so this is this is the sderuv.org i put that website on your sheet the san diego college area aruv and notice here's montezuma they have a picture montezuma and there's i don't know what that street is I can't figure out what that street is, but you can see just behind it on the light post is a light. So when you leave the church today, either going that way on Montezuma or that way on El Cajon, look for that light wire that's right above you on the, on the uh, light posts. And now you'll know, aha. So now when you come to church, carry as much as you want in church. Yeah, it looks like fishing wire. Yeah, but you'll notice here, Every day, it has the updated Aruv status. As of June 28, 2019, 8.30 a.m., the Aruv is operational. So now you're, ah, now you can, let me show you the map here. Okay, so that's the Aruv. All the, all the way around that is a wire. It goes down Montezuma. This looks like Colwood. Then El Cajon. And then where El Cajon meets up with, let's see, the synagogue's right here. If you live inside this Aruv, then you can move around and walk on the Sabbath day. And, and that's what I mean, that's exciting. If you teach the same class, at, you have to talk in the abstract and say, well, you know, there's this Aruv over in, at the college area. And they go, what are you talking about? I've never seen this before. But you guys have clearly seen that that wire. The question is, why does Jesus stop at Bethphage? Because think of this, think of an Aruv as the city limit sign. If you're on the Bethphage side of the Mount of Olives, you're outside Jerusalem. But if you go to a certain point, now you're inside Jerusalem. 
And what does Zechariah say? Your king comes to you, Jerusalem, on a donkey. So he, Jesus goes right to the point. So here's Bethphage. Here's the, the Mount of Olives stretches. It's actually three mountain peaks that go just like this. So here's the Mount of Olives. That's the Aruv for Jerusalem. How do you know where you can walk? Walk right out to the Mount of Olives. Don't go any further. So Jesus is being very intentional. He stops at the city just on the outside of the Jerusalem city limits, so to speak. He gets on the donkey. This is why David Flusser thinks he doesn't go very far. He walks into Jerusalem and says, okay, send the donkey back. I don't need it anymore. I made my point. And the whole crowd goes nuts. And we think, why are they shouting like that? Because they know what's going on. Now, we don't know how far he went, but the point is, he's crossing into Jerusalem on a donkey to make his, the statement. It's all he needs to do. And they all know their Bible, and they all want King David to come back, or at least the descendant. Let's go now, turn to Acts 1, and I'll show you where this shows up in the text. So, Acts 1, 112 is talking about the disciples going back and forth uh, between the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem. And how does this sentence describe the Mount of Olives? Yeah. A Sabbath day's walk from the city. Now, whose Bible, there's got to be at least one of you, doesn't give you that phrase, but tells you the distance. Okay. Is that in a footnote? Okay, yes, yeah, some of you have a footnote. Now, why do they footnote the distance? We are all Westerners. And unfortunately, when you tell somebody a Sabbath day journey, what's your first question? How far is that? Now that's totally a Westerner's question because Westerners want to know how much does that weigh? Give me the equivalent weight in ounces so I can compare it to my bag of flour at home. It's totally Western. An Easterner doesn't say that. An Easterner says, why'd you tell me that? What's the symbolism of that statement? Because a Sabbath day walk, it's only, it's not even a mile. It doesn't take that long to walk there. Bonnie and I did it. Oh, it was exhausting. We went down through the valley, and then you have this really steep climb up to the top of the Mount of Olives. We were like, ay, ay, ay. It didn't take us long, though. I mean, it's an hour. Yeah, a lot of people, they'll, they'll drop you at the top and have you walk down because, you know, they don't want to upset their, the tourists on your trip. They, walk, they, help, they have you walk downhill, not up. There is a handrail going up. It's a steep. My point is, it's not that far. So Sabbath day journey must mean something. And so an Easterner doesn't say, well, how far is that? An Easterner says, what does that mean? What's the symbolism behind that phrase? Why are you telling me that? And now you, you say, oh, because that's the marker that says how far I can go. If you just go, oh, it's three quarters of a mile. It doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't give you the details of what's behind that. In fact, let me show you what the Greek actually says. This drives me nuts a little bit. This is a, a website. You can pull up all the verses and then look what's in the Greek. So you have, here's the English, the, the mount called Olives, which is near Jerusalem, right? This shows the Greek word that's actually in the text. And then this is what the, the Strong's concordance number. You can click on the root of that word to see all the different ways. So look what it says. The Mount called Olives, which is near Jerusalem. Now it says a Sabbath day. There's no problem with that. But look at the next word in the phrase. Holding. Does that show up in your Bible? No. So it says a Sabbath day holding journey. Well, what does that mean? What, what's the Aruv defining? Carrying a load. Where are you allowed to carry a load? 
So you're holding something, and it tells you how far you can walk holding something. But all of our translations leave that word out. Because if we said in English, a Sabbath day's holding journey, or a Sabbath day having journey, you would all say, what on earth are you talking about? What does that mean? There's actually one version that I found. It's an international version that puts a Sabbath day having journey. Because that word actually means to have something. So I have this in my hand. Right, and that one's, one part of me that gets so irritated is if they put the word in there, it forces you to say, hey, pastor, what does that mean? And then it forces the pastor to go find out. Now, that's a good point, and part of the reason God gives you a Sabbath is so you'll stop doing that for at least 24 hours. Yeah, at least put some limits on what you can do. I think this would be wonderful. Bonnie and I decided, so we're running over time, but Bonnie and I decided a few years ago, we're going to take a Sabbath, 6 p.m. on Friday till 6 p.m. on Saturday, and all of our friends rebelled. You're doing what? You mean we're not allowed to ask to see if you can go out to dinner? You mean we can't plan something? I mean, because culturally, we all expect for you not to have a Sabbath time. And when you try to do it, all your friends get a little upset. What do you mean you're blocking me out for a day? Well, what if our whole community, you knew that on that day, you never ask a favor of anybody, and no one asks a favor of you. It takes the whole community believing in it to, to actually adhere to it. I hope this helps. What I want you to see is the very intentional movements by Jesus. That everything has a place, and he's doing things not just randomly. And when the people see it, they get it. They know exactly what he's doing. Okay, so we'll keep going on somewhere around Mark 11 and 12 for the next couple of weeks. And look for that Eruv marker when you're driving back and forth. We can talk more about what, what the work, she asks, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, but they could climb the Mount of Olives. And so there's, there's certain things that you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath, certain work items. And they're not random. They get them because in the book of Exodus, as they're building the tabernacle, as they're building the tabernacle, there's something like 36 or 37 items that they see happening during the tabernacle, building the tabernacle, and then God says, keep the Sabbath, and they build a golden calf. So those 37 items are the ones that you're not allowed to do on a Sabbath. They're not random. But anyways, you can walk around the city, you can go to synagogue, certainly the rabbi is working if he's working the, the synagogue, but those aren't considered to be normal work.